Today's case is a case unlike any other. It's a case that is inspiring in more ways than one and really just shows how much persistence and strength we as humans can have. This case broke in the media in 2017 when a 33-year-old victim testified in her own murder case. Now I know, that's a little bit confusing. How in the heck could a victim testify in her own murder case? But get ready, because we are about to go through it in its entirety and break it all down. So guys, my name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. This is Tend to Life with Annie Elise. Okay, I'm going to get straight to the point. I hate credit cards. Actually, correction, I hate credit card debt because I swear, and I don't know if you're like me, but no matter how much I feel like I'm keeping things in check and I'm keeping a mental tally, it's like it just stacks and stacks and stacks. And then I get the statement at the end of the month and I'm like, oh my God, how am I ever going to pay all of this off? And then I'm just paying the interest and I just get into like this quicksand hole. It is awful. It doesn't matter if it's credit cards, student loans, medical bills, debt is debt and it is so stressful. Well, today, Today's sponsor, PDS Debt, has customized 0% interest options for anyone who is struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or even medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at like an all-time high right now, it can be hard to figure out how to cover everything while also paying down past debts. But now is the time to stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. So if you're making payments every single month on your debt and your balance just are not going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment so that you can save thousands in interest and fees. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies. And get this, there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit are both accepted. PDS Debt is also offering a free debt analysis to our listeners just by completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash life. That's p-d-s-d-e-b-t dot com slash life. So guys, take back your financial freedom today and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time by visiting pdsdebt.com slash life. Judy Malinowski was born on August 26, 1983. She was the beloved firstborn of Bonnie Bowes and Thomas Hensel. The family resided in suburban Ohio and were a loving family. Judy had a very happy childhood. She shared a special bond with her younger brother Patrick and adored her sister Danielle. Her radiant beauty was undeniable, and it earned her recognition in various beauty pageants. In 2001, she achieved the honor of being crowned Miss New Albany and was also selected as the homecoming queen at New Albany High School. Upon graduating from high school, Judy pursued her education at Ohio State University. Not only was Judy admired for her physical beauty, but she also possessed an inner beauty that radiated from within. She had an extraordinary capacity to love others unconditionally without passing any sort of judgment. Passionate and affectionate, she carried a free-spirited nature and a very sharp wit. Judy had the remarkable ability to bring smiles to those faces around her and uplift their spirits any time it was needed. Putting others' needs ahead of her own was just second nature to her, and she effortlessly just illuminated the lives of those fortunate enough to know her. According to her mother, Judy simply yearned for a modest and content life. Her aspirations included living in a nice home with a normal neighborhood and raising two children. It appeared that she was beginning to fulfill her lifelong dreams as well. Judy got married to a man named Ron, and together they welcomed two daughters into the world. Kaylin was born on March 12, 2004, and Madison was born in September of 2007. They were the epitome of Judy's love and affection. She often referred to the two of them as the colors that painted her heart, ensuring that they always felt cherished and always felt nurtured. 
During Judy's pregnancy with Madison, her relationship with Ron took a heartbreaking turn when he betrayed her by having an affair with another woman. The trust between them was absolutely shattered, leading to the split of their once promising bond and happy home. Adding to Judy's challenges, she had previously battled and triumphed over ovarian cancer when she was a bit younger. Thankfully, she went into her mission. However, in 2006, the devastating news arrived that the cancer had resurfaced. To combat the reoccurrence, doctors performed a complete hysterectomy. Unfortunately, this procedure brought in a number of further complications. Enduring excruciating pain as a side effect, Judy turned to the use of opioids, a coping mechanism that became distressingly common during that era of excessive opioid prescriptions. And regrettably, her reliance on these medications reached a critical point when her insurance stopped covering the opioids that she desperately was relying on. Trapped in that desperate situation, she resorted to street drugs, ultimately falling victim to the grasp of an awful heroin addiction. Despite the challenges that she faced, Judy's family remained dedicated to supporting her, assisting in raising her children, and provided any possible aid in her journey to overcome the addiction. With time, Judy began to regain her independence and make significant strides forward. She secured her own living space with some girls who were also recovering from addiction. She went to multiple NA meetings a week, maintained sobriety, completed a rehabilitation program, and relied on disability benefits, which she received due to her medical conditions, including cancer. Additionally, her mother's assistance with her financial obligations paid a crucial role in her progress, as she often helped Judy pay for her bills. Judy was doing the best that she had ever done at this point. In 2014, Judy received a message from a man named Michael Slagger on Facebook. It's worth noting that Michael and Judy were not complete strangers, as they did have some prior connections. Michael was acquainted with Ron, Judy's former partner, and their shared circle of friends. Judy had interacted with Michael, Ron, and their mutual friends in the past. After a prolonged period of no contact, Michael took the initiative to reach out to Judy, leading to their reconnection. Their first date proved to be a pivotal moment as it sparked a deep bond between them, making them pretty much inseparable. From that point forward, their relationship flourished. But ultimately, during this period, Judy faced a relapse into her addiction, and from there, everything went downhill. Regrettably, she remained unaware of a critical aspect of Michael's past, his extensive and questionable criminal history. Unbeknownst to Judy, Michael had a troubling record possessing various serious offenses such as theft, stalking, violence in both domestic and sexual manners, battery, breaking and entering, as well as child endangerment. He was also a registered offender at one point. Consequently, Judy inadvertently exposed herself and her family to the presence of this dangerous individual, unaware of the potential risks that he posed to their well-being. And despite her mother expressing her concern about Michael, Judy remained dedicated to him, quoting, You can't judge a book by its cover. The relationship between Michael and Judy became extremely unhealthy and very toxic. In May of 2015, the situation escalated to the point where the police had to intervene. They would engage in intense and aggressive verbal altercations, with Judy either screaming, fighting back, or leaving the scene. Interestingly, it was usually Michael who would contact the police to report these incidents involving Judy. It appeared that Michael used this strategy to assert control over Judy and intimidate her into compliance. After around 30 different calls, the police began to suspect that he used this as a tactic to make Judy believe that the authorities were on his side, thereby instilling fear in her and dissuading her from continuing their fights. During their relationship, Michael would provide Judy with the drugs that she was taking, even though he didn't use any drugs himself. This created a situation where Judy became reliant on him, as he was the source of her drugs. Judy's addiction made her dependent on Michael, as she needed him to fulfill her drug cravings and maintain her habit, and Michael used this to his advantage. 
This dependency kept her continuously returning to Michael as he held the power to satisfy her addiction. Bonnie, Judy's mother, tried several times to basically rescue Judy from the situation that she was in. However, Judy was very fearful of Michael and fearful of the threats that he made on her life and was scared at how their relationship had become physical previously. Most people would be fearful in that situation. Judy had previously tried to get help from the police on several occasions, but she was never taken seriously, and they basically just labeled her as a drug addict and wrote her off. In August of 2015, Judy showed a lot of courage by deciding to leave her difficult situation behind. She chose to enter a rehabilitation program in Gahana, Ohio. She did this to address her addiction and create a distance between herself and Michael. On August 2nd, Michael agreed to drive her to the rehab center. However, when they arrived, Judy felt anxious and uncertain about entering the program. She wasn't ready to proceed, and she wanted to take a brief detour to a gas station. Her reasons were twofold. She needed to purchase cigarettes, which were allowed at the rehab facility, and she wanted to check in with her family one last time to keep them informed about her situation. During the drive to the gas station, the two of them were in an argument that only escalated more and more and tensions were running extremely high by the time that they arrived at the Speedway gas station in Gahana, Ohio. Michael entered the gas station to purchase the cigarettes, while Judy sought a moment of solace behind the Speedway gas station. Unaware of her whereabouts, Michael drove around to the back and spotted her. Him stepping out of the truck only intensified the argument. Witnesses recall that Judy splashed her soda on Michael, provoking a drastic reaction. Michael went back to his truck, retrieved a container of gasoline, and doused her with it. Shockingly, he then retrieved a lighter, approached Judy, and set her on fire. Witnesses promptly dialed emergency services upon witnessing this horrific incident as Michael callously observed Judy's excruciating suffering while her entire body was on fire. Her body was one enormous flame. Law officers initially thought before arriving that maybe it was a small fire accident and someone was just burnt, maybe a little bit, but they had no idea what they were coming up on. Officers swiftly responded to the scene and Michael initially attempted to pass off the incident as an accident. He tried to claim that a little gas splashed on Judy when she was filling up the tank and then caught fire when she used her lighter to light a cigarette. However, the police were not fallen for it. This wasn't an accident. Her clothes literally melted off of her. Eventually, he admitted to deliberately dousing Judy with gasoline and igniting the flames that engulfed her when he offered to light her cigarette with the lighter. But little did Michael know, this was all on videotape, and it clearly showed what really happened. After detectives obtained the CCTV footage from a nearby bank, they went up to the hospital where Judy was. The detectives and police officers huddled up in a small room in the hospital and they watched the footage for the very first time together. It was silent, and they were horrified at what they had just watched. News Nation had aired this footage, so we can also see the CCTV footage that they witnessed. A word of warning, the video you're about to see is disturbing. In 2015, the mother of two was at a gas station with her boyfriend when they got into an argument. The couple had a history of fighting, and on this day, the boyfriend, Michael Slager, doused Judy with gasoline. Surveillance video and 911 calls captured the sickening scene that followed. Okay, stop screaming because I can't understand you. I got you. Let's I got late. you. I got you. This is a woman on fire. Judy was taken to the hospital with her life hanging in the balance. Doctors couldn't predict how long she would survive due to the seriousness of her injuries. Her body had been severely burned, with third and fourth degree burns covering over 90% of her body. It was an incredibly terrifying situation. A nurse got in touch with Judy's mother and informed her that there had been a terrible accident and that she should come right away. She didn't know anything other than both Judy and Michael had been burnt and Judy needed to be intubated. When Bonnie arrived, she passed a room that Michael was in, and she stopped to ask where Judy was. Michael immediately began to yell it was an accident, 
and the police and medical staff quickly shuffled Bonnie out of the room. At that point, Bonnie was just praying for hope, and nothing could prepare anyone for the condition that Judy was in. Her condition was so bad and traumatic that Judy's sister was in the hallway vomiting everywhere and passing out. Now, in the burn world, they have an equation for mortality, which is based on the patient's age and the percent burned. And in Judy's case, she was 31 years old at the time and approximately 90% burned, which made her around a 110% mortality. Detectives were concerned with Judy dying and them not getting anything on the record as far as a statement from her. The detectives just wanted to hear her side of it, and doctors even looked at them and asked them if they wanted them to bring her out of sedation. They knew that they had to do it. So they brought her out of the coma, and the detective who was questioning her later noted that there weren't even any ears to speak into questioning if she could even hear him. Nonetheless, Judy was able to answer his questions. The detective asked her if she spilled gas on herself, where she shook her head no. Then he asked if Michael poured gasoline on her, and she shook her head yes. This gave detectives the indication they needed to pursue the investigation even harder now. Throughout her time in the hospital, Judy underwent over 50 surgeries and procedures. She had also coded seven different times. She also had to fight off multiple infections that caused her to develop really dangerous fevers. The doctors couldn't even fix the giant open wounds on her back and her buttocks because she was too weak to lay on her stomach during the surgery. The process of changing the dressings for Judy's burns was extremely agonizing for her. Additionally, she had to endure surgeries for skin grafts and reconstructive procedures. But unfortunately, some of these surgeries didn't go as planned. It was truly heartbreaking that Judy had to face the loss of her hair, several fingers, and even her ears. She had also lost the ability to speak over a whisper due to the extensive damage to her trachea. Judy remained in a coma for several weeks, and throughout her time in the hospital, she encountered numerous critical moments where her life was in jeopardy. There were instances when she needed to be resuscitated to keep her alive. Breathing became a struggle, and her ability to move was severely limited, causing her intense pain whenever she tried to do so. I mean, just imagine trying to move when 90% of your body is covered in fourth-degree burns. However, despite these immense obstacles, Judy displayed incredible strength and determination. Her children and her family stood by her side, offering unwavering support. Even while in a coma, her family noticed her gritting her teeth, a clear sign of her unyielding determination to survive. At the same time, Michael was lying in his own hospital bed, hardly injured, by the way. Police informed Michael that he was being arrested and that they have video footage of the entire incident. Michael was taken into custody and charged with aggravated arson and felony, where he pleaded not guilty. News Nation has since shared the insane footage of Michael speaking to law enforcement from his hospital bed. I didn't think I got, you know, there, there was that, you know, really it was going to be that. Sure. So she was, I walked over to give her a light. That was it. And then she just... And she, when she went up, I couldn't believe it. I just didn't think that it was going to be like that. And as horrible as it sounds, for the first several months of this case, with Judy's life being so up in the air, the prosecution was just kind of waiting on Judy to die so that they could charge Michael with her murder and then potentially go after the death penalty. Warren Edwards, the Franklin County prosecutor, said, and I quote, I could probably prosecute for another 20 years and not get a case that is so right for the death penalty. And then... One day, he got the call that he never expected to get. Judy was awake. Judy persisted through ongoing pain and the permanent alteration of her appearance, understanding that she would never fully recover. Nonetheless, she possessed a strong will to live and pursued her aspirations for societal change. When she finally saw herself in the mirror for the first time two months after the incident, she vowed to do whatever she could to help other women. She was determined to find a way to make the laws around this type of crime change. Despite her declining health, she remained resolute in speaking her truth, 
with vivid memories of the events etched in her mind. Judy expressed her determination to testify and sought to wean herself off pain medication over several weeks, enduring further agony simply to ensure that she was mentally prepared to share her harrowing experience. And despite the possibility that she might die, she was steadfast in her decision to testify against Michael. The morning of trial, the prosecution was ready. However, Michael and his defense team understood that the jury's perception of him would be greatly influenced by witnessing Judy's condition and listening to the harrowing details of her unimaginable suffering. This awareness strengthened his belief that the jury would be even more determined to ensure that he faced a substantial prison sentence. So at the very last minute, he changed his plea, and he entered a plea of no contest for the charges against him and was subsequently given the maximum sentence of 11 years in prison. This was the highest punishment that could be imposed for the crimes that he had committed. And this also meant that he avoided a trial, in which case Judy wouldn't be able to testify against him. He had silenced her yet again. Judy's family found it truly devastating to realize that he would only spend 11 years behind bars given the immense harm that he had inflicted. It just seemed like an extremely low price to pay when Judy would be suffering from this for the rest of her life. The judge was truly distraught over the entire situation and even looked over at the prosecutor and said, I blame the legislator that I cannot sentence him longer. Judy's medical bills were in the millions by this point. Bonnie, her mother, decided to file for victim's assistance to see if she could get some help in covering it. However, they sent her back a letter stating that they were sorry to inform her, but if someone has had any kind of illegal substance in their system in Ohio, then they don't qualify as a victim. Bonnie tried to fight back, but they said that the law is the law and that they would absolutely not be giving them any money, which is honestly just so heartbreaking. Judy wasn't perfect. She was human, and she was on her way to rehab when this happened. She was trying to get better. From her hospital bed, Judy and her family made it a mission to fight to change the laws for people who hurt others the way Judy was hurt. They came up with Judy's Law. Judy's Law would increase the maximum sentence for abusers by 5 to 20 years for people who intentionally disfigure another person. But the law would not be retroactive meaning it would not have any effect on her case. But still, she continued to fight for survivors of domestic disputes. Her oldest daughter even spoke to senators about Judy's Law, which NBC4 Columbus aired on their newscast. Today, Judy's oldest daughter, Kaylin, testified in front of that Senate committee. Her daughter spoke on her behalf. It was an emotional day for the 13-year-old who told that committee in her own words that while the man who committed the crime got 11 years, her mom, sister, and she got a life sentence. She also said how when he gets out of prison, she will be 22 then, and no one knows if and when he will hurt again. I spoke with Kaylin today, and she says it wasn't easy to, easy to speak in front of all those adults, but that she did it because she knows it would make her mom happy. She means a lot to me. She's really special, and she's funny, and she's pretty, and she looks just like me. Now, I look just like her. We all know that a person only has so much resilience, and eventually, Judy's body began to give out before her spirit did. The prosecution began to explain to Judy that there would be nothing but Michael's story for a homicide trial, and that's when they asked about her testifying to her own homicide which was a long shot because it had never been done and no one had ever testified in their own murder in the United States. In Ohio, there isn't a criminal rule with regard to preserving the testimony of someone that, that everyone knew was going to pass for a future criminal prosecution. It was genius. She was going to essentially be testifying from the grave. They scheduled a hearing where the judge declared that Judy could give a deposition via video. However, she was going to have to come off of the pain medications that were essentially keeping her comfortable in order to be lucid enough to where she could speak under oath. It was incredibly painful while she was on pain medication, and now she was coming off of the pain meds just so that she could get justice for herself and for everyone else who was ever in her position. The level of pain she was in is honestly unfathomable. The time came and it was Judy's time to shine, and... Boy, did she ever. 
During her testimony in January 2017, almost a year and a half after the incident, Judy eloquently and confidently described the events that transpired on that fateful day, all from her hospital bed. She faced rigorous questioning from both the prosecution and Michael's defense attorney. Judy revealed that Michael had been driving her to that rehabilitation facility, where she was expected to enroll to better herself and her addiction. However, she made a spontaneous decision to postpone her admission at that particular moment. Instead, Judy expressed her desire to have a conversation with her daughters and her mother before fully committing to the rehab center. As a result, they made a stop at the Speedway gas station. Judy needed to purchase cigarettes because she was permitted to have them during her stay at the rehabilitation facility. It's worth emphasizing that she had entirely depleted her cigarette supply and needed to restock. During their car ride, the couple's argument persisted. As Michael went inside the gas station to purchase the cigarettes, Judy took the opportunity to find peace behind the speedway by herself. When Michael returned and noticed Judy's absence, he drove around the back of the gas station to locate her. He found her behind the Safeway and parked alongside her, demanding that she get back in the truck. Michael stepped out of the car, and the argument between the two of them escalated. Judy openly admitted to throwing a cup of soda at Michael, causing it to splash all over him. Michael then hurried over and made his way to the opposite side of the truck, swiftly grabbing a large canister of gasoline. Without hesitation, he drenched Judy's body with the fuel, starting from her head and even pouring some down her throat. Judy vividly described Michael's demeanor during this horrifying act, emphasizing that he appeared utterly callous and just stone-faced. There was no humor or playfulness in his actions if such a thing could even exist in such a situation. He just exuded pure evil, remaining impervious to Judy's desperate screams and pleas for help. His sole intention was to inflict harm upon her, all the while screaming and hurling insults at her relentlessly. And even after screaming and begging for help, he didn't listen. He grabbed his lighter and he set her on fire. Now I want to play a part of the deposition for you, shared by the Columbus Dispatch. While he went inside, you got out of the truck and went behind that speedway. There's a bank there, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, what happened as you uh, stood behind that speedway? Well, he might be in, in a matter of no time at all around in his truck. Uh, he saw me and immediately slammed the truck in the park, got out, demanded that I got into the truck with him, called me all sorts of names. Uh, we argued for a good five to ten minutes and then I threw my pop on him. You threw a pop he, on him? Yes. Uh, did you splash it on him or actually throw the cup at him? I threw the cup at him. Okay, and this cup, was it uh, a hard plastic or paper or what was it made out of? I believe it was a styrofoam cup. Okay. Um, uh, did the drink get on him? Yes. What was his reaction to this? He was extremely upset. And what did he do? He ran around to the other side of his truck and he got his uh, nose of gasoline that he had cut the back of his truck. Uh, it was a really big and had a lot of gas. He ran around to me and started pouring gasoline started up my head and worked his way down. Some got in my throat as he did that. That burnt really bad. The gasoline in your throat burnt really bad? Yes. And uh, what, what happened as a result of having this gasoline poured on you? He then set me on fire. Well, let's slow down a little bit before that. Uh, were you, did you remain standing, or were you standing when he poured the gasoline on you? No. When he poured the gasoline on you, were you standing? No. Go ahead and tell us what, how you were when, when he poured the gasoline on you. I fell down and I was leaning on my right side, holding myself with my right arm and hand. Okay. 
So did you fall down as a result of that burning sensation from the gasoline? No. Okay, what caused you to fall down? I fell, well, I fell down completely the rest of the way. But I originally had fell down because I mean, he had pushed me. I tripped when I was running from him. Okay, you tripped? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, when you trip and you're falling and, and you're laying there holding yourself up on one hand uh, and he's pouring gasoline on you, what's his demeanor as he's pouring the gasoline on you? You fall just completely evil. He's not, he's not responding to any of my cries for help. He won't tell me why. He just is like, you want to throw something on some, or you want to throw a cop on me, see what I'll do to you, bitch. And how do you like this? And just all sorts of vulgar names. Okay. So, Judy, was, was this a joking demeanor? You poured something on me, I'm going to no. pour something on you. Ha ha, isn't this funny? No, it was an evil demeanor. Okay. Uh, and, um, after he poured the gasoline on you, um, what happens next? He backed away from me for about 30 seconds and I kept telling him to please help me and stop and I'll get, I'll get the truck, I'll go with you. You know, um, why, how, why would you do this? And I looked at him and he, pulled the lighter out of his pocket and he started walking towards me and I just remember crying and begging for help and he let me on fire and the look in his eyes were his eyes went back literally after I was set on fire and he that's when his eyes just turned black as I screamed for his help okay. and he did nothing how that moment felt when you were ignited? It felt horrible. I don't think words can describe what it feels like to have your whole body on fire. I can remember the fire out of my face and eyes. I can remember screaming for help. I can remember looking over and seeing him just standing there staring at me with the look in his face that was just like I keep saying over and over again, pure evil. Like there's no other word to describe it. My whole body felt like the worst burn you could ever feel in your life. Okay. And it stung and it was like a thousand needles going in, a thousand hot needles penetrating my body. I guess that's the best way I can explain it. And I just remember, like I said, begging him to help, pleading for any help, trying to get the fire off of my face, eventually burying my face in the grass and walking around. And then um, I got to the point where I couldn't see anything and everybody's voices were sounding far away. I could tell there's definitely somebody around, but I said, here, I'm going to get out. I thought for sure I was dying. I just prayed to Jesus to please forgive me for my sins and to take care of my children. And that was it. I blacked out and I don't remember anything until I woke up in the hospital. During the cross-examination, Michael's attorney, of course, brought up Judy's history of drug use, highlighting instances where Michael had accused her of theft or even self-harm. Judy denied these accusations completely, asserting that Michael had fabricated them to exert control over her. The attorney also focused on the day of the incident, pointing out that Judy was under the influence of drugs at that time. Furthermore, the attorney questioned why Judy did not run away during the 30 seconds when Michael temporarily walked away to retrieve the lighter after pouring the gasoline on her. Judy explained that those 30 seconds felt much shorter than they seemed, as she was primarily focused on removing the gasoline from her body. 
Additionally, Judy mentioned that she had difficulty standing up due to a problem with her shoe, which caused her to fall or kind of sit down during the entire ordeal. Instead of running away, she pleaded with Michael, expressing her willingness to go back into the truck and accompany him if he just refrained from causing her further harm. It was three long hours of questioning. When Bonnie went into her hospital room after the deposition, Judy hugged her mom the best she could, and her whole body just shook. The stress from testifying and the stress on her body made her health decline. Her sister questioned at that point why they couldn't put people to sleep like they do pets, and they told her that Judy could not die from medicine because that could impact Michael's murder trial. After two years, Judy was moved from a medical facility to a care facility and was no longer receiving medical treatment. Judy served her deposition in January 2017, and tragically, less than five months later, on June 27, 2017, Judy had succumbed to her injuries, and she passed away. Immediately, Michael was charged with her murder. During the deposition, Judy was asked about her desired outcome if she were to pass away from her injuries. She expressed her wish for Michael to be charged with murder and face a life sentence. On July 5th, 2017, Michael Slager pleaded guilty to murder charges as part of a plea agreement. Judy didn't want Michael to suffer the same fate as her. Instead, she hoped he would undergo a transformative process while serving his sentence. During the hearing, they played Judy's deposition for everyone to hear, and Michael was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In exchange for the death penalty, had the case gone to trial. Judy's forgiveness and selflessness were truly remarkable, as not everyone would or even could possess such a forgiving spirit in similar circumstances. Before Judy's passing, her final words to her daughters emphasized her love for them and the importance of remembering that they were the colors of her heart. On September 7, 2017, Judy's law was enacted in Ohio, and now attackers who intentionally disfigure their victims will have more prison time added onto their sentences. Judy's story is truly unlike any other, and she really did make a difference in her lifetime. She has changed the game for so many domestic victims and truly is a role model to not only her daughters, but every young woman who faces those challenges. It is just such an incredible and remarkable story of resilience and determination. It's one that I felt compelled to come on here and share with you guys, not only because of her story and generating awareness, especially about domestic disputes and how quickly and life-threatening they can become when they escalate, but also because of Judy's law and because of the nuances and little pieces of information within this case. It just is such a heart-wrenching story and such a story of strength and love and even more than that, compassion. The compassion she had for Michael when he clearly didn't have any for her. So I appreciate you tuning in and listening with me on today's case, guys. Please don't forget to show your support for the channel by hitting that thumbs up button on your way out. Quickly hitting subscribe if you haven't done so yet. It's totally free. It'll just make sure that my videos, when I post new ones, show up on your YouTube feed. Um, and that way you stay in the know of all true crime cases. All right, guys. Thanks again for tuning in. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.